Hi everyone. So I wanted to do a little video uh, from that uh, super cool exhibit um, by uh, New Yorkers. That was one criteria, and uh, with uh, from Andreas Keller, the gallery owner here, and it is called New York New Fumes. And you have here 21 olfactory artists. Uh, one of them works in a large fragrance house, but otherwise all the other ones are. Um, so-called independent, I don't like the term, but even the person working in a large fragrance house is doing this as um, a private initiative. So in fact, just right here, you have 21 um, artists just in New York, so you can imagine how many of us we are in the world. I think people don't realize that uh, something that is happening is that the number of call them independent or artistic or uh, so the, the, the people that are not staff perfumers, uh, that number not just is growing, but I think now has surpassed the number of staff perfumers. So this is quite a groundbreaking moment. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing I want just to, I want to mention a few uh, uh, pieces here. So you should come here, the gallery is open today. Then the gallery is going to open, uh, to close for about two weeks and reopen on January 6th till January 22nd. Uh, and the gallery is all the way downtown between uh, Chinatown and the uh, financial district. So uh, you will see, so you see, I want to start by these shoes here. They, they mimic the shoes by Lou Reed. The picture is Lou Reed with David Bowie. Uh, you will see one day I will show, I did a fragrance one day for an artistic installation for David Bowie and Iman. And I found a little bit left so we'll showcase that in the, in the store. Uh, that's also quite, quite unique. I couldn't believe I could find this, uh, this all again. I know it sounds weird, but these are the kind of thing you do so many things and then you don't archive uh, everything. So um, uh, this is very interesting because, for instance, this one, specifically this one, it says, here comes the wave. And if you smell this scent by itself, or looking at the white wall, or looking at the dark leather shoes, you are going to see different facets in the scent. In fact, when you look at the white wall, you see that it's animalic, but also furry and cozy. And then if you look at the shoes, you're going to see all of a sudden the leather is stronger, and you also see the rubber of the sole, the soles. So um, this is really unexpected. and. In a fragrance, you always have different facets. Even in one molecule, I don't know anything, any molecule, any ingredient that does not smell of several things. When you have red, it's only red. When you have blue, it's only blue. Uh, in perfumery, that does not exist. That something smells only of one thing. And so then when you have many in a composition, that, may, that can smell of a lot of things. And depending on what you're looking at, you have to do this at home. Take a glass of red wine and drink it looking at a very dark background in your house. And then drink it and look at a very clear background in the house. Or look at your very flowery wallpaper and then look at your fireplace. You are going to see different facets in your red wine. Do that with tea, do that with a fragrance, even a fragrance you know very well, a fragrance you spray every day. Spray it on a piece of paper or a tissue paper. And then you smell this fragrance looking at a certain area in your house or look at uh, your partner wearing a dark shirt and then look at yourself or somewhere else with a, a white or flowery or something very contrasted. And you are going to see different facets. It's really amazing how it goes fast and how we are very, um, uh, how shall I say, um, subject to this kind of uh, subjectivity. So to be clearer, the act of smelling, the act of smelling, I find is actually very objective. Just like the act of looking, the act of seeing. If you look at this, you're going to say this is black. No one is going to start saying, oh, but I see it white, I see it red, no, it's black. Now, some people are going to say, yeah, it's black, like anthracite. Some people are going to say it's black, like the fireplace. Some people are going to say, it's black that the, the night in uh, Iceland, uh, when there is no uh, city lights anywhere, this is, you can interpret the color black. You can interpret the color red, saying this is love, this is a heart, or this is blood, this is threatening, this is a fire department, or this is a Ferrari, or 
So depending on what red evoke in your mind, but you are going to interpret it in different ways. It's the same with the scent. But plus added to that, it's not just the way you were educated with a certain smell, let's say of leather, but it's also your mind is going to see one facet or the other in that scent, okay? Now, the last thing I want to mention, it doesn't mean in any scent you see anything. And so you still have to be educated, you have to know how to smell, and uh, it's not a convention, it's just you have to learn how to interpret the signals and to see them all that your nose is giving you. Now, your nose is not giving you a signal. If there is no mushroom thing in there, it's not going to smell of, smell of mushroom or, or jasmine. Eh? So uh, it doesn't work just everything with anything. No, it's a chameleon, but uh, it has to fit and the visual has to fit. It also works with the auditory, by the way, but that would be a different story. So I really encourage you, you come here and then you look at those smells. Uh, the smell you're smelling here, oh, I just saw, a, I just saw like an amber laddanum note in there, it's cute. So you will see the smells here I find are very complex. It doesn't smell, they are perfumey. They actually, many of them are not perfumey at all, but they are complex, so it's hard to describe, but you're going to see uh, different emotions that the artist wanted to put in the, in the scent. Um, well, then another one I want to uh, discuss is uh, the one I've made, which is right here. You see, I want to show you. So you have two parables. I'll do a specific Patreon about this thing here. But for now, we are going to look at the parables and it's dramatic. You see the white is interlinked with the black, with the lock, lock and key. The keys is in the back. And then you have a nose here, okay? And then uh, I'm going to show you what they say. So inside the parable, how does that work? This is like a little tea cup. The parables are made of ceramic. They happen to be made by the porcelain, Imperial Porcelain Manufacturer in Berlin. Bon. And in there, you see the scent is on those little beads. These beads are made of kaolin. Kaolin is the material, it's a clay that you find naturally. And this is the clay you use to make, it's a very white clay that you use to make porcelain. So that's called kaolin. When you cook kaolin, then you get this, uh, the, the porcelain texture and then you can varnish it on top. And here, even though you have this varnish, on it, the scent does stay in here. And so, when you smell a parable, you're like you by yourself in your own world. You see? Just like when you do a tea testing session, you know, they, they smell the lid first always because the lid gives you a lot of information. It distills a little bit the scent, if you wish. It's not as harsh as going, having your head in the thing. And my point here is in the two parables, I have exactly the same scent. And you go crazy, crazy because you think it's two different scents. And so, and in the second one, this is what I wrote. So you see, it's a black. So it was actually the black, does not, you cannot buy it on the market. It was custom painted for me because I really wanted to show people how the color of the parable is uh, impacting. And ich bin black. You remember when uh, John Kennedy was in Berlin and he, say, he said, Ich bin ein Berliner, I am a, an, an inhabitant, I'm a citizen of Berlin, meaning I feel compassion for the people of Berlin and I defend their cause. You remember when you had the terrorist attacks in Paris, uh, especially the one inside this uh, satirical magazine at Charlie Hebdo, and then everybody was saying or wearing a t-shirt saying, Je suis Charlie, I am Charlie. It's the way now in the world to say, I feel compassionate with these people or with this cause and I defend it. You attack them, it's like attacking me. So that's the moment, see I get the goosebumps, that's the moment I want to recreate this, but also so that whether you smell by looking at the parabole right here, this black parabole, you see, with the black little beads, and, or you're looking at this dramatic moment when you go like this, 
even when you close your eyes, it's the last thing you saw or you look at it, you are going to see, as I said, two different scents. And I try, I interpret the leads, then when I look at with the black leads and the white parable, I see another scent, etc. The scent is disclosed, it's disclosed on the gallery website. You know, when you have an installation and you always write uh, plexiglass, leather, you put the ingredients of the installation. So, on the, on, the, uh, on the paper here, you see on the sign, I put all the ingredients. So you have porcelain, you have kaolin, you have cable, but you also have different ingredients. And I've, list, I've listed them all here, and in a way that you can understand them. So even the molecules, I kept their, uh, what is it called? I kept their marketing names, their, their uh, commercial names, so that you know meaning you put lilial, you don't start putting para, tertiary, butyl, da 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 so that people reading can see right away what it is. So, I want to mention a few others. Uh, I know, before, another thing that's very interesting people never think about. You see on that paper, you can read all this online on the gallery website. I have the statement of the artist to help people understand because people are not used to appreciate olfactory art, so everybody has a little explanation. At the same time here, I had to write a modus operandi to tell people how to use this and uh, also how to use that for the collector that would get this piece hopefully one day. So in fact, those parables have been acquired by some collectors, like a collector in Chicago, a collectress <laughs> uh, in uh, a German collectress living in Switzerland. She's a chemistry professor, actually. Uh, acquired several pieces of that. And um, the people, it's like, imagine you buy a musical installation. You don't have to write the instructions how to use the speakers. You don't have to write the instructions how to renew the MP3 file or whatever file because they don't die or they don't evaporate. So we have these challenges in perfumery, which is about how people have no idea about perfume technologies, and so they don't even know where to start, so you have to explain that. And then you have to explain how to replenish. And this is why we are going to launch this more officially, this certificate of perennity, which means eternity in the museum language. Uh, and authenticity, which is when you have a painting, you get a certificate of authenticity from the painter and saying it, it is indeed an edition. So everything here in the gallery, by the way, is edition one of one. It's very unusual. Edition one of one. At least myself, I do not have any artist proof. So the person acquiring this, that's it. That's for him or her for, for forever. And um, voila. So I want to show you another piece that I found. I found them all very, very interesting, I have to say. Huh? Uh, and I truly say, say that not because Andreas is listening, is listening in the background, you see. He say hi. <laughs> That's Andreas, the gallery owner. And very interestingly, Andreas is a very big olfactory scientist. So that's very unique. Yes, we love science. You know, I love science too. And so he decided to create this gallery. As far as we know, it's the only uh, gallery in art gallery in the world dedicated only to olfactory art. So, thank you, Andreas, because this is quite, quite remarkable. Needs a lot of faith uh, to launch something like that. And uh, like the other Andreas in the Mianki Gallery, you know I'm represented by the Mianki Gallery in, uh, in Berlin, he sees the olfactory art the same way as photography, maybe 80 years ago or 100 years ago. Photography was not considered an art. It was just considered a thing like a plumber, uh, you know, they would just say, well, you just put some object, you click on the button, and then the, the camera does everything, and then you develop with some chemicals, and then you have a photo. So it took a while for people to understand that uh, there is something to photography, and then people have to understand that, but then, even more, the collectors have to understand, and they have to believe that it's going to be an art that keeps its value or increase in value with time. That's also very important for collectors. They don't buy something that evaporates in one month and then they're left with nothing. So that's why also we're going to have this certificate and a system to replenish the art. Um, now, luckily in perfumery, as long as you don't wear the thing, you know, you, you consume a bottle very fast. If it's just to smell in the air, just a little bit can last for years and years and years because the nose needs very, 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 very little 
to smell. So this works on our favor. And for something like uh, in the parable, to send them for maybe 25 years, you need like 10 grams. I did the calculation. You just need two, three drops by beads. And if they stay closed, like on a, co like a coffee table book, um, then you just need to replenish them like once every six months. And so with 10 grams, 20 grams, or 50 grams of scent, you, that's enough for 25 years, 50 years. Well, and then we're going to have a system to uh, remake it for the collector specifically. Another one, that's someone with whom I've been chatting, we've never met in person uh, on Instagram, but I think this piece is quite remarkable because he was talking, he was describing on and on about some vintage sandalwood, about some vintage wood and stuff. And then uh, I smelled, and in fact, you can see how the furnace is totally not sandalwoody, woody. It's another one of those compositions where you use an ingredient to give, I love to say je ne sais quoi, because I don't know how to describe it. It mixes with other ingredients and then it gets a new form. If you know l'air du temps, this is a typical place where isoeugenol, you don't smell it that smoky in there. You don't smell it. I would even argue you really smell uh, lilies, like Casablanca lilies or gardenias. No, but it gives this je ne sais quoi. It gives uh, something nurturing. Here, it gives almost like a human character to the composition, plus all kinds of, I mean, he has also the description here. See, he has two Assam woods. He has uh, uh, fine tuberose. Uh, Indian wild grass, the hookus, and um, cinnamon, etc., etc., et and then some tinctures, and uh, where is the cedar wood? I don't, I don't know, the sandalwood. Uh, here, Mizor sandalwood, vintage, and then you also have an in Indian, Indonesian sandalwood root oil. So this I've never. And then prepped with iraceum. <laughs> I love iraceum, that's fabulous. So voila. Then you have also Gail here who has something, so it's impossible to describe. The smell here, I guarantee you come, it's so subdued. It's there, it's not strong, it's very, I would not even say animalic, it's very humanalic, <laughs> because it smells more of human, but it's not sweat, it's not sperm, it's not, it's just, uh, I don't know, it's skin, it's, uh, bon, it's really, really well done in all the subtlety, and so she doesn't put the ingredients, so that must be some weirdo thing, but it's really fantastic how you can, um, you show, um, uh, you can create all these different smells and with words, the descriptions, and I'm not very good at that actually, the descriptions, they repeat, but the smells are very different. But well, to describe, uh, good luck, huh? good luck. And then there's another piece here by Calder. So he had also some technology inside. So uh, uh, some lighting, and then you see the ball is fixed. And what is cool is that you can remove the cap and then you can spritz yourself. So the ball is fixed, but you turn around the ball. I think that's a, a cool idea. It's very dynamic. And, uh, well, and then I think it looks good and it, it really makes the scent, brings the scent to value what's inside the bottle versus the ball itself. What's important is what's inside. So, voila. Uh, at least you have a little tool. You see everybody has a very specific packaging and uh, sometimes it connotes what's in there, sometimes no, and, uh, and it doesn't matter, and then you have to, to smell the different, uh, the different things. So voila, you would have a look at this bottle here. This is like super cute. This is like an uh, explosion-proof bottle. You, say, you can do whatever you want. You could smash it on the floor. Nothing is going to happen because it's all inside. I don't know what it's for. This is for like some nuclear, uh, not nuclear, but whatever. Some explosion device or uh, whatever. So, Voila, you have a little, um, you have a little tour of this, uh, the gallery. Huh? So when you come to New York, now if you come between January 6th and January 22nd, you have to pass by, he by here and you are going to uh, experience, it's like a really uh, olfactory trip to experience all the different um, uh, installation and uh, uh, what should I say, artifact. So, voila. Hope you like that and uh, thank you so much.